theology. And he asks, why? What is it about Reformed theology, that is, the heirs of John Calvin, that enables that tradition to grasp the fullness of Scripture, unlike any other branch of Christendom? Let me put in parenthesis here. I argue a lot with Arminians. And I used to, I used to buy the criticism that Calvinists were driven by an ironclad logic and ride roughshod over the scriptures. Never have I seen such a hocus pocus in my life now that I've spent 20 years on this. It's exactly the opposite in all of my discussions. This is a system. I give a hoot about systems. I don't care about naming systems, but this is a theology that has embraced Scriptures, and when you press scriptures on the Arminians in my denomination, they just go everywhere into philosophies. How can this be? How could God do that? How can this fit with that? How can this? I said, I'm the logic chopper. Don't talk like that. <laughs> just text after text. And so... This is true historically, whether, whether you met some Calvinist along the way who just argued because, well, if this is true, this has to be true, blah, 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 and never quotes texts, forget that guy and go to the Bible. But historically, this system has been able to comprehend 1 Timothy 2.4, 2 Peter 3.9, Ezekiel 18.33, and many other texts along with all the great Calvinist pillar texts into one authentic, integrated, whole counsel of God. And Gerhardus Voss is very eager to find out why that is. Why? And here's his answer. Because, quote, because Reformed theology took hold of the scriptures in their deepest root idea. That's why. This root idea which served as the key to unlock the rich treasuries of the scriptures was, and then he puts it in italics, the preeminence of God's glory in the consideration of all that has been created. It's the relentless orientation on the glory of God that gives coherence to John Calvin's life and the Reformed tradition. Voss said, the all-embracing slogan of the Reformed faith is this, quote, the work of grace in the sinner as a mirror for the glory of God. Mirroring the glory of God is the meaning of John Calvin's life. Mirroring the glory of God. Now, when he gets to justification, which he did very quickly to Satellite, when he gets to justification, this is what he says. You touch upon justification by faith. The first and keenest subject of the controversy between us. Wherever the knowledge of it is taken away, the glory of Christ is extinguished. There's the bottom line for Calvin. You don't begin with justification. This is what sets him apart from Luther. And this is a fundamental, that's too strong a word, a very significant difference in the two traditions as they come down. I mean, these men were eye to eye on the glory of God and the uh, sovereignty of God and the predestination of God and the election of God. Luther and Calvin stood on the same footing, but there was a slight nuanced starting point difference that has, I believe, made a difference in those traditions. And the glory of God is the starting point for John Calvin and those who have followed in his footsteps. That's the deeper root than justification. For Calvin, the need of the Reformation is this. This is a quote now from... Um, um, Parker, T.H.L. Parker. Rome, this is his interpretation of Calvin, I think it's right. Rome had destroyed the glory of Christ in many ways. One, 
by calling upon the saints to intercede when Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. Two, by adoring the Blessed Virgin when Christ alone is to be adored. Three, by offering continual sacrifices in the Mass when Christ, the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross is complete and sufficient. Four, by elevating tradition to the level of Scripture and even making the Word of God dependent for its authority on the Word of man. Calvin asks in his commentary on Colossians, how comes it that we are carried about with so many strange heresies? He asks that. And here's his answer. Because the excellence of Christ is not perceived by us. That's what I was praying about, brothers, at the beginning. Something happened to this man. The excellence of Christ is not perceived by us. Which means, I believe, that where a passion for the glory of Christ weakens and the center shifts, everything shifts. Which bodes very poorly for us today in doctrinal faithfulness. And you can see it. Just think of them. Think of the shiftings that are happening today. There's a root. It is a marvelous thing. How conserving, as Spurgeon said, how conserving are the doctrines of grace to a hundred other doctrines. How preservative is an orientation on the absolute supremacy of the glory of God in all things. And when it is forsaken and not talked of much, and in fact, seminary teachers will say, I think the, the love of God should be stressed more. So many things follow right in the train. It doesn't even take a generation before heresies begin to follow in the train of the loss of the centrality of the majesty and the glory of God. For Calvin, the Reformation was needed because the glory of Christ had been extinguished. So the unifying root now, I'm arguing, of Calvin's life and labors is his passion to display God in Christ in his majesty and glory. When he was 30 years old, he looked to the end of his life and he described an imaginary scene, one of his writings, of himself at the last judgment, giving account to God. And this is what he anticipated saying. O oh God, the thing at which I chiefly aimed and for which I most diligently labored was that the glory of thy goodness and justice might shine forth conspicuous, that the virtue and blessings of thy Christ might be fully displayed. Then, 24 years later, one month before he gave an account to the judge in death, he wrote in his last will and testament, I have written nothing out of hatred to anyone, but I have always faithfully propounded what I esteem to be for the glory of God. That was his estimation, at least, of his writing and his life. Now, here's my question. This is my key question that I want to try to answer and unfold with you. What happened to him? Because I want it to happen to all of them. My people. I want it to happen for the joy of all the nations. That's our mission statement up there on the wall. I want it to happen in your churches. Or in you, if it hasn't happened yet. What happened to John Calvin to make him a man so mastered by the majesty of God? And second part to the question, what kind of ministry did it unleash in Geneva when it happened? 
So that's my 